Hey guys, I am Chelsea Fagan and this is the Financial Confessions. Welcome back. And we have a guest today that I am very personally excited about because she is someone that I was a friend of in New York. We went out to dinner sometimes, we hung out, and then she moved to Los Angeles. And if you guys live in New York and know what happens when someone moves to Los Angeles, it's as if she died. <laughs> and now we're hanging out again and doing this podcast. But before I introduce you to my friend, I wanna talk quickly about the partner that we make this podcast with every week. So as you guys might know, we make every episode of the Financial Confessions in partnership with Intuit, which is an amazing group of products, most of which I either use personally every day or have used several times in my life to great success. They make things like QuickBooks and TurboTax and Mint, basically tons of financial products that help make every financial decision and obstacle and challenge in your life way more easy to understand and way more effective. If you've been thinking about getting better with your own financial life, definitely check out all of Intuit's products at the link in our description or the show notes. So person who moved to Los Angeles but used to live in New York, what is your name? My name is Erin Ryan. Tell us about yourself. Well, where do I begin? Uh, I'm a writer. I used to be a journalist back in New York City. I worked at the Daily Beast and I did uh, CNN, HLN stuff. And then um, somebody who worked in entertainment was like, you should try writing for TV and gave me a job. And so I moved out here. So now I'm a TV comedy writer. And I also host a podcast with Crooked Media, um, which is uh, the Pod Save America people. And it's about sort of women politics, kind of the ways that our lives intersect with public policy and you know the way that big issues affect individuals lives what is that podcast called it's called hysteria very cool it's uh ironic because women get it Hyster yes hysteria it's like being hysterical <laughs> yes yeah, exactly so. um but we yeah it's, that term it's yeah i know we're trying well you know it's funny when we first named it uh, i'm doing this ironically oh it's so fun and there i noticed like a generational difference in the response to it like women above a certain age were like i don't like that name and i think it was because when they were younger people were probably using that word against them mm. a lot more and now it's sort of like out of fashion like i'm never called hysterical or like a harpy or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, being hysterical. It's, it's very like a madman. Right, like a right. Woman. It's like a, it's a sort of like noir woman being like, I couldn't go to the police. <laughs> and then he's like, now like, what? He and slaps he's like, her and he's like, <laughs> yes. get yourself together. You're hysterical. <laughs> so yeah, I think that, that like the generational divide is probably because those women grew up being maybe hopefully not slapped by Humphrey Bogart, but they grew up maybe being called hysterical. And you worked at Jezebel too, didn't you? I did. That was where I got my start as a writer before I was doing that I worked in finance actually um wow. yeah so my first I think I remember that now that you say it yeah I had forgotten yeah I'd like to forget too uh, oh <laughs> what did you do in finance out of um, curiosity well I worked at Merrill Lynch and I was oh, a doing what? I was a broker in retail brokerage and uh, I was there during the crash Oof. which was not it wasn't a fun time to have a job and need insurance <laughs> uh it especially wasn't a fun time to have a job and work for a, a, a large financial company that was every Friday just laying people off. Um, and But I you know, was always a person who couldn't just rely on somebody else's money. I didn't have parents who paid for anything. So it was like, look, you work at Merrill Lynch until they fire you or you move back in with your parents who can not afford to support you. So it was right. like, it was a survival thing. And I, I worked there, I held on uh, for maybe five years, I think. And then- wow. I left because I got a job writing for Jezebel and I was like, bye. And I left from Chicago, I moved from Chicago to New York for that job and have not wanted to work in finance since. Um, I'm curious how that experience has shaped your investment strategy on an individual level. One thing that I learned from that that's really important is that it's really important to save when you're young. Mm. It's it's worth so much more to make some sacrifices when you're young than it is to make to wait until you're in your 30s. Um, so I started investing in a 401k and like, I was not very good with debt, I was, but I was really good with saving, weirdly. So I was really good at socking away a little bit of my, my paycheck every week. And I still have like this lump of money from when I was working at Merrill Lynch that I haven't touched and will not touch until I retire. So I will say that it informed my strategy because it taught me that like, I would see people coming in every day who would be like 45 and just getting started and it would be like, wow, you're not going to retire. Like you're, yeah, you're, I mean, you can, but it's going to be a really tough 20 years. Right. Exactly. You're going to be living on a fixed income that we don't even know if it's going to be there. It's like, 
it's it's really if you want to get to a point in your life when you're no longer working and earning money you have to save a lot of money when you're young yes i think yeah a lot of people don't realize that i, I want to say the average number is something like 1.4 million mm-hmm. it's like 1.4 1.2 i don't know what it is but for like a, a healthy middle class retirement with the ability to do a little bit of traveling to have some mm-hmm. you know luxury expenses like within reason for about 20 years of retirement like mm-hmm. it's it's over a million dollars and again i don't know the number off the top of my head but yeah. a lot of people have a really hard time imagining that because they're like I live on $65,000 a year how could I need to be a millionaire well divide that number by x amount and like leave some for contingencies you know it's right every American even Americans with really good insurance are one medical catastrophe away from complete financial ruin I think it's something like 50% of people who get uh, cancer. cancer file for bankruptcy or something within like, that. like two years yeah all of their money is drained so it's like like when I was working in finance in like 2006 to 2011 it was like, you know, people could come in and be like, I have good insurance, this, this, and this. Now the, the question marks are so much bigger. Yeah. Um, and so I think, I guess maybe the, the the main ways that working in finance influence me currently is like now I save money. And also now I assume that I can't take any of it with me. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I save money, but I have it in the back of my head that it can all just go away in a in a second yeah and what am I going to do then and where can I you know is there any way for me to safeguard what I do have and those are questions that are like super complicated and if you do want to like protect your actual like assets from medical seizure or whatever then you have to like invest in the help of a professional I think but so what took you from finance to working at Jezebel was the next stop yep Jezebel was the next stop and it's very odd like I guess here's a Here's a kind of funny story from when I was a little kid. I used to love doing gymnastics. We had a big front yard, lived in the country on a dirt road. Nobody ever drove by the house, but I loved doing gymnastics. I used to do tumbling runs down this like long stretch of grass that was right by the road. And in my mind, someday a gymnastics coach would drive by and see me doing <laughs> cartwheels. And no, that obviously never happened. But uh, when I was, maybe uh, for the best that that strange man never drove down your yeah, dirt road and was like, you want to do those flips into this <laughs> truck? Hey, little girl. <laughs> You're pretty good at cartwheels. You want to be a gymnast. <laughs> Actually, yeah. I feel like I'm glad that didn't happen. But I used to, you know, I, I was in this like very rural area and nothing ever happened and nobody, you know, it was in a place that nobody Where were you from? Was. Wisconsin? Northern Wisconsin. Hell yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, very, very rural, remote. Um, but basically that happened with my writing career. Like I was uh, a commenter on the website and mm. like they had like this very vibrant commenting commenting community it wasn't just like first and like youtube racism Mm. it was like a pretty well curated community of like smart readers and uh then the editor like noticed my comments and was like you're very funny do you write and i was like haha no and she kind of kept cajoling me until i agreed to like write a couple test posts and ended up working out it was that's how my writing career started and then um i was a contributor and then i uh, i worked on sundays i i was the sunday editor so i'd wake up at like six in the morning and work until like 6 p.m and i got paid i think 115 dollars shift and uh, then i would go to my normal nine to five job on monday through friday and like i was just completely working for the weekend because i loved the writing part so much and then after a year of that i asked them to hire me full time and they did So that's how that whole thing got started. And as I mentioned at the top of this, so you worked at Jezebel and the Daily Beast and all that was in New York. Mm -hmm. And then you were taken out to LA by television writing. Yeah, so um, this is another version of like, I was just doing something publicly and somebody noticed. Uh, I have a Twitter account that I'm pretty active on and I would- What's that? (laughs) Social media. (laughs) Uh, it's, uh, It's a flaming pit of hell. But like eight years ago, it was cool. Um, But yeah, I had a Twitter account that I would mostly use to like tell jokes and share news stories that I thought were interesting. And I got a DM from the creator of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And he was like, you're really funny. Let's like, I'd love to email you something. And I was like, okay. And he emailed me and was like, let's talk on the phone about you writing for TV. And it was like, we talked on the phone and he became sort of a mentor to me and ended up hiring me to write for Always Sunny. I didn't know what I expected it to be like. I thought everybody would be mean just Mm. because like, I don't know. I've like been around a lot of comedians and they tend to be kind of, I don't know. There's a certain type of comedian that tends to be very like uh, petty and egotistical and stuff. Um, A type. I know a lot of nice comedians, but that's one type. Uh, 
everybody was super nice. It was like people who had been writing for the show forever. And then I was the new, I was the only person who was like totally new in the writer's room. And on the first day, we just sat around a table and like talked about things we thought would be funny and like news stories that we're interested in. And then we put like push pins up on the I board. I was right. Yep. P- push pins up on the board. And a lot of them were like, some of them made sense. You know, they all made sense because we were all in the room when they were written down. But by the end of the like, cycle you know once we'd written the season if you went back and looked at like the board from the first day it would be like charlie poops his pants what like they just (laughs) they you know it's like it was a well-formed idea but now i've like lost what it was um but yeah it's you sit around and you talk about ideas and then you break them down into things that might make good episodes and you break the room in half and half of the room works on one and half the room works on the other and then you switch ideas and you critique what the other one room is doing and everybody pitches jokes so every single episode of that show is has like pieces of every single writer in it so like I don't think there was any show any episode that people didn't have input in it was like every single person very collaborative is it nine to five during the uh it depends on like what type of show you're working for like always sunny is really humane like Rob and Charlie both have kids and you know they both have other stuff they're working on and David Hornsby who's um one of the executive producers and is cricket on the show if you watch the show Mm -hmm. he's writer in the room too and he is married and has kids and so it's usually like we would get in nine or ten in the morning and we would usually be out by like six or seven at night. Right. The latest we ever had to stay was like 9 p.m. And it was only once. And they like bought us dinner and were really apologetic about it. Other writers' rooms are totally different. Mm. Like sometimes, you know, there's certain showrunners uh, that I'll tell you off mic. Uh, there's certain sh- showrunners that are like notoriously like sadistic. Um, like there's one in particular that has like a reputation where he'll, he would like make people work until 3 a.m. And then <gasps> tell them that they had to be at work at 6 so a lot of people would just like sleep in their offices and then like, yeah, it's it can be really gross and bad. Also because like, you know, it's a it's a union job, so you're paid pretty well. And like considering how much money you're generating, it's like pretty fair. And uh, it's a lot of money per week compared to what an average person would make. But you also have to keep in mind that in a lot of cases, this like 10 to 20 week period of the year is the only time that this that person that is, is working. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, you, but you know commensurately the some showrunners kind of think they own you for that period of time like if right. you have like a 15 week contract they own your ass being like monday through friday plus weekends like they just will you know call you up and own your ass but sunny is not like that at all it's very like monday through friday sometimes we get like assignments over the weekend where it's like yeah sometime over the weekend why don't you watch a noir or like sometime over the weekend why don't you read this article that we're all mm. talking about um but yeah it was it was like pretty good but it is very uh tiring because you're basically in a meeting the last six hours and like and then you take lunch and then you are in another meeting it's just all day long and you have to be engaged you can't just there's no spacing out you just have to kind of be there all day long and so that that does get really tiring well I catch episodes every now and again can't say I'm like a regular viewer but always funny have to say enjoy it yeah, it's fun because like all the characters are the worst people you can imagine. Right. And because they've been written that way for like, we just finished our 14th season, 14 seasons of them being the worst people in the world means that you can do anything to them. And the audience will be like, yes. That's like Grey's Anatomy <laughs> numbers for yeah. seasons. That's yeah. crazy. It's the longest running live action American sitcom. That's crazy. Well, congratulations for that. Guys. I had literally nothing, <laughs> literally nothing to do with it. Yes. So I think a lot of people assume that TV writers must all be incredibly wealthy, that it's like probably a very lucrative job, especially if you're on a hit show. What does a TV writer actually make in general? Well, it really depends on how much your how much experience you have. Um, what your rate is, what mm. your if you have agents, which we had to fire all of our agents this year, which was a whole whole thing um Drama. yeah yeah uh it's it's all about how much experience you have what kind of show it is where it airs how long it is there's all these different things if you join the wga they give you like a schedule of minimums and the minimums tend to be for like a person writing for like a weekly sitcom i think the minimum is like i think it's like between three and five thousand a week Mm. per week of your contract but then you know you get taxed as though you're making that for the entire year right so like the amount that you actually see is not 
very high compared to right. like what that sounds like. But you know, as you get more experience, um, usually when you get offered a new contract or if you brought, get brought on for a new season, um, there's increases in pay. So you start out making three to maybe three to five thousand a week, depending you know who you are, who your agent is. And once you get to be a producer or like a story editor, executive story editor, it goes up to like seven, eight, nine thousand. Once you're a producer, it's like ten thousand. Executive producers, fourteen or fifteen thousand or more. And those people also get a share in like other forms of revenue the show generates. Writers do too, but it's like a lot smaller. So it's like it's a very convoluted way of saying if you're working for a show that has like a I don't know, let's say you have a sixteen week writer's room you get paid, you know, $80,000-ish or so, like roughly if you're just a low-level writer and you can get paid a lot more if you're a high-level writer. But you're not, like like I said, you're, the taxes situation is significant and TV writing is lucrative and so it's very coveted and there are, you know, for every person in a writer's room, there are like 15 PAs, writer's assistants, and like other people that are just graduating film school, like really good novelists, all these people that have the skills necessary to be a good TV writer, just kind of waiting in the wings. Totally. So unless you've been doing it for a really long time, the, the newer you are, the more interchangeable you are, like the more disposable you are. Like if you're just a TV writer with a one season's experience or whatever, um, you know, you can easily be replaced. You don't have like this deep knowledge of the show. You don't have like chemistry with the other writers. It's... It's a very like fraught and like nerve wracking lifestyle. And you know, there's some there's some writers who will just write for one show, and they won't get another job for the rest of the year. So like, if you're an always sunny writer or something, and you're trying, you can try to get in another room, but you might not. Um, and which means that that's the only income that you're making. So it's it's sort of a lifestyle where you have to be in survival mode all the time, mm. unless you're an upper level writer or producer. Um, which yeah. is, you know, it's it's like anxiety inducing for sure. The funny thing is with a lifestyle and an income fluctuation like that, a person being smart about a job like that would be striving to save like 50% of their income at least. And I mm -hmm. have a, a strong speculation knowing the people in media that I know that it's probably not the case for most. There are, there are some people that are pretty good at it. Um, but I think that most people that have been doing it for a little while have a good sense of like, saving and splurging like mm -hmm. i know one writer who she and her husband always go on these big long amazing trips after she's done working in a writer's room so it's like they don't live an extravagant lifestyle or anything like that but they do this one cool big thing yeah like um, teachers who go on vacations during the beginning of summer yeah exactly sort of and um and then there's also you know some people uh try to supplement their income there are other ways to make money as a writer besides being in a writer's room sometimes you get hired to do like punch-ups on a script uh, you get to hire to do an outline on something. Like you're not necessarily working full time in a writer's room, but you might be working on a film, but not the whole film, just like part of it. You might do punch ups where they uh, they'll call like a group of funny people together in a room, and they'll you guys will like work on a, a scene and like help the movie be funnier. Like with kids movies, they a lot of times they'll hire comedians to do punch ups and stuff. That's so. such a fascinating world to me. Yeah. So the job took you to LA. Mm -hmm. Job took me to LA. I had illusions about being bi-coastal because I thought it would be like cool and glamorous, mm -hmm. but it just, it's not. Uh, I was exhausted all the time. I didn't know what time it was. Like, Wait, so how were you doing the bi-coastal? Like what was that I was, setup? I was like work, I was still working at the Daily Beast, um, but I was a contributor. So they kind of just let me come and go as I pleased. Um, and then CNN HLN was like amenable to my travel schedule. So they wouldn't book me on weeks that they knew I was going to be in LA or they would just book me specifically for an LA flash studio instead of being like in studio in New York. Um, so I would be New York for like three weeks, LA for like a week and a half, New York for three weeks, LA for a week and a half. And, that and did you maintain apartments in both? Um, no, out here I did Airbnb whenever yeah. I, uh, whenever I stayed out here. Cause it was just like my real home is New York. I'm a New Yorker, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then I got to a point where it was like all of the money I was making was out here. Right. Um, the company that the, the company I have a podcast with is out here. The show I write for is out here. New York started to feel like a vanity project. It was mm. like, I don't, I don't need to be here. Like, and also I'm tired and I really yeah. want like a place to live. So I finally, um, I got offered a different job on a different show. Um, I'd written for Sunny and then there's this new show out, out on Apple TV called Mythic Quest. It's not out yet, but it's coming out and uh, worked in season one of that writer's room. And uh, once I got that job, I was like, okay, there, it makes no sense for me to be 
ping-ponging back between New York and Los Angeles. So I kind of like hung on. I, I was like subletting my apartment, which you've, you've been in my apartment, right? Not the latest one. The one that, because you moved up to uh, Harlem. Harlem. Yeah. You were right on top of Central Park. Uh-huh. I don't think I ever went there. I was okay. downstairs from it one day. Okay. Like when we met up. But right, yeah, right, right, no. right, right, right. Above that little place called Rendezvous. Yeah, um, still there, I think. Yes, it's, yeah. it's actually a really nice little spot. It has yeah. a really good happy hour special. Oh. Um, Hot tip. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I sublet that place. And mm-hmm. I was like, because I was like, eventually I'll be back and forth again. And it's like, no, you won't. So mm. I just was back in New York specifically to get rid of all my remaining stuff that was there to like ship oh. it or was get it. Was it like in a storage it. unit? Mm -mm. It was in the office in my old apartment. So like... Oh, you still had your old apartment? Yeah. You sublet it for that long? Was that two years? It's like a year. You're a little over a year. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, it is crazy. Crazy. Dreams are crazy, Chelsea. Rip rip New York City for you. I know. And you miss it. I do miss it. It's just like... It's a it's hard. Everything about being in New York is hard. Like Mm. the weather sucks. The trains don't work. The people... They're pretty nice actually, but the tourists are bad. Um... And everything's a pain in the ass. But at the end of every single day, you feel like you accomplished something just by continuing to be alive. <laughs> yeah, it, no, I mean, it's true. It's true, you do. I feel like I, I, I was thinking about this recently. I feel like I, you can draw, it's, it's a graph that is just one line of uh, the amount of money you have and the amount you enjoy New York. Yes. And the thing is that there are quite a lot of things about New York that I like objectively. I think it's, I don't drive and I don't, I, well, I, my license is expired. I can drive. It's like, if someone's got like, if someone's dying, I could drive them to the hospital, but I don't drive. Uh, and I don't like being in cars. I don't like being in, like nothing to do with cars I enjoy. So that eliminates a lot of cities for me. And I do think in general, it's better to walk everywhere if you can. So I do like that about New York. Lots of great cultures. Clearly New York has a lot going for it, but I do think that the extraordinary cost of living is really kind of a shame. And I know I've never, I didn't move to New York intentionally. I moved there because I had a job there that I couldn't keep working remotely for. And I hated it for many, many years because I was like, why am I here? I didn't sign up to have to live this way. And I think a lot of people come to New York and have those like sparkles in their eyes and like are happy to live in, you know, a squalor, a utter squalor in Bushwick (laughs) and commute an hour and a half every day to their two jobs. And I just never experienced that where, oh, and also I cannot not my husband and I or we're not planning on having children and I partially wonder if that's something that has come out of the fact that I don't think I could ever have a decent life in New York with children I don't oh, think yeah. I've, I've got that in my bones yeah a, a, a baby is like fully an albatross around your neck in New York unless you're rich because there are people on the like upper west and upper east side you sometimes see that are like like very uh like they, they display their big oh, family. Yeah. You'll see like four blonde children oh, walking yeah. hand totally in hand. It's totally like a status symbol in the upper yeah. Have you read a book called Primates of Park Avenue? This is the second time I'm talking about no, this. No, no. Please read it. It's so fascinating. And one of the things she talks about is a, one of the biggest status symbols on the Upper East Side is how many children you can have because that means you have that much space, that many nannies, that big of a car. Like it's a whole thing. And she's Ugh. like, you'll literally meet women who, are, who have six children on the Upper East Side. And it's like some kind of a cult scenario, but it's just because that's like the chic thing to do if you can afford it. The life can be so incredibly hard there and really the only true like lubricant to life in New York City, the WD-40 is money. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of money. Yeah. And even with money though, it's it's so dense that everything is going to be a little bit of a pain in the ass. Like there is no way to money your way out of traffic. So what is your favorite thing? What do you love about living in LA? Um, I love the fact that you can live like a human being. Um, I like, I remember when I first got out here, I was like, okay, get in an apartment. And, uh, I was like, you know, looking at these places and it was like, um, I was dazzled by what I could get for the amount that I was paying in New York. And like, it was a real, it is dazzling. Yeah. It was a real extravagance to like live alone. I I found this like beautiful vintage Spanish building Mm. that had this gorgeous vintage like, in california it was like from 1983 no, no it's like well it was like from the 30s yeah and, yeah. yeah and uh it's just like beautiful and like it's actually not far from here um and it was it was just like i had these beautiful arches and like little things built into the wall and i was like this is oh everything's so charming it had a balcony uh palm trees outside of it and these big like windows with like wooden shades that would open up. Oh, it was yeah. so beautiful love that. yeah i loved it i loved that apartment and and as soon as I moved in, I was like, oh, like this kind of ambient stress that lived in the area right around my heart just sort of like dissipated. 
Like, no, it's true. Like survival stress. Like in New York, it's, it's kind of always like fight or flight. What's going on? What's the next three things I have to do? Everything is logistics. Everything yeah. is planning. And then it was just sort of like, it was just so much more relaxed. I love that the weather is good. Everybody loves the weather. But I underestimated how much it impacted my mood. Mm. Um, because a cloudy, bad weather makes me very grumpy. And like, you know, not having very much light makes me sad. And being out in a place where it's like, pretty much sunny every day not today but it's pretty much sunny every it's day pouring it's pouring rain today yeah it's uh, you get you came for the bad weather i know and it was just the first snow in new york it was oh. a magical time oh the <laughs> only really made a lame trade off <laughs> i know the only time the snow is magical um although la is really beautiful after it rains it's yes. like clean and green and it's it's great Gosh. um i love like there's these big like kind of wild parks right inside the city that you can just like yeah. hike around in there's great hiking um, like Griffith Park is beautiful. Elysian Park is beautiful. I love the east side. I love that you, it's easy to get out of LA. Like if yeah. you just are sick of it and you need to go to Joshua Tree and take some mushrooms, you can totally do that. Um, if you want to go like, you know, to the, the ocean is here. If you want to go to the ocean, if you want to go to Venice for some reason, you can go to Venice. It's pretty easy. Um, there's like wine country that's close by, not Napa, but like a, a lot more down to earth version of Napa. Um, yeah, there's a lot of beautiful things to do and outside stuff is like a, a lot better here than it was in New York. Although Central Park is incomparable and there's true. nothing. It's no, spectacular. It's wonderful. I was like kind of wedged between Central Park and Morningside. Yeah. That was like, and it was just like beautiful. Morningside Park is a great park. I live in Morningside Heights and so it's uh, definitely like a fave. Yeah. Uh, I will say, so we just moved into a new apartment and I, I think honestly, so it's just under a thousand square feet, which to me is like, this is perfect for two people. I do not need it to be bigger than this, mm -hmm. but that is like ludicrously bigger than any apartment I've lived in in New York. Yeah. I was like, going to say a thousand quite large. square feet. That's yes. crazy. But the two most exciting things about an apartment, and this is how much New York City beats you down. There are two entrances and exits to the kitchen. So I can go through the dining room or through the hallway two entrances and exits to a room who's ever heard of such luxury that's crazy and i have an actual dining room where you can walk comfortably around the whole dining table which has never happened to me before it's always like some nook or like you have to like pull it out or like it's like cramped in the side of your living room right and i'm and i think on some level because i i i'm fascinated by like the tiny house stuff in the sense that like i feel like if any trend should come to americans it should be living in smaller less you know sprawling places but it does make you realize after five years of or for me six years of living there you're like wow i'm really that hype about being able to walk around my dining table <laughs> right right you know um do you ever think you'll live in a in a city that's neither or San Francisco, if you could just take all the awful people out of it, just like oh, have it, yeah. if it were more like its original like hippie intentions, like San Francisco could be cool. Nice weather. Yeah, I've never been to Portland, um, but I've, I think I would like it. I loved, I lived in Chicago <laughs> for a while. It's so cold there. I, I loved Chicago. It was very cold, <laughs> but like Minneapolis is also great. I love Minneapolis. Yeah. Um, my family's from near there, so nice. like I could see myself doing it as like a, it would have to, in my mind, I would have to live it like an expedition. Like we're doing, we're doing this like Arctic expedition for like eight months of the year. It's like unlivable, but for three months or for four months of the year, it's great. Actually, a funny anecdote about people in Minneapolis. Um, I was there doing a show, uh, a live Pod Save America show called uh, Love It or Leave It. I was doing Love It or Leave It live in Minnesota, April 2018. It snowed. It was a huge, it was like a huge blizzard. Our plane from Chicago like touched down right as like the big fat wet like flakes started hitting the runways. We get to the hotel, it is a full on blizzard. They, you know, declare a state of emergency in both Minneapolis and St. Paul. We tried to cancel the show. The venue was like, no, you can't cancel the show. So we, you know, people put out on Twitter, like if you can't make it to the show, your tickets will be refunded. Please don't risk your lives. Before the show, we're backstage and John Lovett and I were talking and I was like, I think if there's not like many people, we should just at the first commercial break, we should just like tell everybody to move as close to the stage as they want. And everybody like it'll be a very like fun, intimate show. He's like, yeah, that's, you know, let's do that. You know, we're, we're not going to be very many people. We get backstage. The place is fucking packed and everybody is hyped. Like, people snowshoed there. People, like, cross-country skied there. People, like, hiked in knee height. Like, it was crazy. The Minneapolis attitude towards snow is like, screw you. <laughs> you are not going to mess You're up not, my plans yeah, to right. go see this live podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, yeah? Well, how about this? <laughs>
I fully do not have that energy. Don't yeah, have that in my bones. I'd be like, goodbye, I'm drinking hot chocolate. I don't care if I get my money back. But no matter what city you live in, you're gonna need the right financial tools in order to manage your life there. And one of the tools that Intuit offers that is truly so awesome is TurboTax Live. You've heard of TurboTax, I'm sure, and many of you have probably used it. I've used it myself many times to file my taxes. And you guys already know how it makes the process of understanding your taxes and getting your maximum possible refund so much easier to understand. But with TurboTax Live, they've added a really cool element where they're providing you with real people. They're providing you with CPAs, EAs, and tax attorneys who are there to chat with you by one-way video chat, which means you can see them, but they can't see you whenever you need to, to answer your questions or help you figure something out. These experts have on average 15 years of experience and come with Intuit's 100% accurate expert approved guarantee. You have a team of experts to help you do it just a quick call away. And if you wanna make sure that you are truly kicking your taxes butt this year, you wanna check out TurboTax Live at the link in our description or our show notes. You mentioned a few times already that you grew up, you know, maybe not a ton of money. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up similarly. Um, and then I moved to New York and worked in media where an inordinate amount of people that I knew really had quite the opposite experience. Mm -hmm. And now I don't think about it as much, but for a long time, it was very, very difficult for me to not feel incredibly resentful and bitter at all the people around me. It's as if they sort of all went through life in like a little like space suit and mm -hmm. had no real like sense of consequences <laughs> or urgency. And I'm curious as to like how that how you dealt with that, how you would, you know, even give advice for people who might be in a similar situation, like someone from not a lot of money who goes to like an elite school or works mm -hmm. in an elite industry. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to a school where a lot of people had a lot of money. I went to Notre Dame for undergrad. And I remember like, this is how sheltered I was. I remember getting to school and uh, one of my good friends, like, t like let it drop that she, I was like talking about scholarships and she's like, oh yeah, they didn't give me any scholarships. And, I, and it's all need-based at Notre Dame. It was like, she, her parents can afford to pay $40,000 a year? That is insane. Like, it didn't occur to it's me insane. that people could just write a $40,000 check. In <laughs> one college, please. Yes. <laughs> Two college, Four colleges. <laughs> one for all of my four kids that I had to show off how rich I oh am. Oh, my God. Um, the thing that really bothered me, and I still have a bit of a chip on my shoulder about it, but now I kind of view it as a superpower, is uh, people like you and me know things that people like that will never know. Mm. And there's something that has always struck me as very pathetic about the like struggle cosplay that they think they're doing. It's like watching little kids play office. Mm. You know, it's like watching a rich kid pretend that they're like struggling or having a hard time. Right. It's like, that's not, no, you don't, you don't know. You, d you don't get emails from the fax machine, little, little kid. You know, it's like, that's, that's not how any of this works. Yeah. Like it is frustrating because I think a lot of people in media and to, in order to enter a creative field, you have to either be willing to live on like canned worms and dirt, have a financial cushion that either you earned or that your parents are giving you. So like my working at Merrill Lynch gave me enough time to build my own cushion so that I could go into create like a creative field and make $40,000 a year living in New York City. But most kids, it's like, yeah, my parents pay my rent. Or, you know, yeah. my, uh, oh yeah, my parents paid for college, so I don't have any student loans. So all of the money that I'm earning, I just get to keep. Yeah. Um, which is a thing that like really drove me nuts. But now I feel like, you know, Daenerys, after she like walks through the fire and she comes out and she's like, I'm still alive. <laughs> like that's, that's what I feel like it is to have been, to come from like a middle class or lower middle class or impoverished background and be able to like find a path in a creative field. It's like you've gone through something hard that other people haven't gone through. And it, I think if you make it through, then you end up stronger for it. I find, and you know, obviously you talk about politics kind of, I guess, on a daily basis now. I feel like people have become comfortable talking about almost any political identity or almost any cultural or, or group identity, except for class, really, in mm -hmm. any meaningful way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of talk, for example, when it comes to, you know, women and female empowerment and what it means to be a strong woman or a working woman, um, that a lot of it is still centered around this idea that the goal for women is to just make as much money as possible or to ascend to a certain sort of corporate status. And I think part of that is probably because ultimately 
we're not really given the tools to talk about class as an identity. We're mm-hmm. not, and people who come from different backgrounds or who have different needs, if you're a woman, you're a woman, and it's very difficult to escape that identity. Mm-hmm. But often people who come from, let's say, backgrounds where they have less will go really far out of their way to obscure that, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and I'm curious as to how you've found in, you know, the work and the talk that you do, how how you've been able to bring money and class and access into that conversation? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the truth. Uh, The truth is that most Americans do not grow up with money. Mm. The truth is that most people that you come across in your day-to-day life, most people that you see walking down the street didn't grow up with by, by having things handed to them. A lot of people, most people struggle. And I don't think that the fact that if you're a woman like me who wasn't wealthy growing up and had to kind of figure out her own way and made a fuckload of mistakes. Um, That's a lot more relatable and important and universal than being a wealthy person and like Mm. only portraying that. So I think, you know, that there's the the old feminist quote, like the personal is political. Mm. And I think um, when it comes to money, uh, in or, like my show thrives because people watch it or people listen to it. People watch us on you know Crooked Media's Instagram. People listen to us, mm-hmm. and the reason people listen is because they hear things that they recognize in themselves. Like they or, and they're exposed to other women who have lived different lives than they've lived. So people listen because it's like okay, we have this really diverse array of women who came from all different backgrounds, and we're all talking about what we're bringing to the table. That's like that's power to me. Is is people tuning in and people seeing themselves in you and because they see themselves being able to like see other women. Um, I also think that uh, I find that people make more of an effort to obscure coming from money than not coming from money. Oh, I think both for sure. Yeah, we're we're at this weird like conflation of it where it's like you want to... It's like people want to have their cake and eat it too. They want to show the symptoms of having come from money without having come from money. Mm. And they also want to advertise that they didn't come from money while still acting as though they did. It's just like this weird cosplay. I also wanted to add that I think that women are really powerful when we talk to each other and when we're honest with each other and when we're open to hearing another person's experience without judgment. That is like, that to me is like female power. And that's not a power that I've seen. This is anecdotal, but I haven't seen that same power reflected in the way that men share and the way that men communicate. And I think living in an age where women are, it's normalized that we talk to each other about money or about our health or about our politics. I think that that only heightens our power it's true i don't want to it's it's extremely powerful to hear to sit down with people who are different from you to listen to people who are different from you and to normalize your experiences and their experiences i think i think that's very true i think there's also i think unfortunately in i think and you certainly probably saw this as close up as anyone would having worked at jezebel at a time when it was you know very very culturally influential um, and now kind of going through all different parts of media and, and still talking about feminism, have kind of seen a little bit of the life cycle of what feminism means in mm-hmm. the public sphere and mm-hmm. how it has probably in some ways, you know, this being something that people talk about, a term people identify with, has done an enormous amount of good. It's almost undeniable, but has also in many ways, I think, been co-opted. Mm-hmm. And it's a vacuum-based kind of definition of what feminism means. And I'm curious as to how, you know, what your view of that was and how you saw it happen. Yeah, that, w- gosh, it's sort of the principle where it's like, if kids really like a toy, it's only a matter of time before the adults ruin it. Uh, like it's, I think when there's a, an ideology that looks forward to a future that is better, uh, that will require work to get to. Um, I think it's really easy for companies to take hold of the hope and erase the work part of it, and like sell the hope back to us without the without the work being. So it's just this kind of like disembodied hopefulness. Mm. It's um, like I I was talking to somebody who works in TV recently, and I was. I am really tired of being pandered to. Mm. Like, I think most people are smart enough to know when they're being pandered to. Like, I don't need a montage of, like, a 95-pound actress, like, karate-chopping dudes Well, like, I'm woman, hear me roar, plays. and You know, it's like, I think right now we're in the middle of a great 
pander that eventually people are going to get tired of mm. and once it gets tired once people are tired of it they're going to move on to the next ideology that they can package and sell without the work attached to it um i remember you probably remember this maybe like five or six years ago it was there was this like annoying trend of celebrities being asked if they're feminist in magazine profiles. Yeah, okay. Remember that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Only female celebrities. Right. Never male celebrities. Right. And then whatever they said became the cover line. Like, I am a Taylor Swift. I am a feminist. You know, whatever. And like, I think that more than anything like stripped it of its meaning because it's like, how do you answer that question? Yes, I want people to like me or like, no, I don't understand that I need to say yes in order for people to like me right now. Do you identify as a feminist? Yeah, but I also think that there's a lot of problems with... Fe- I mean, it's like saying, yes, I identify as a person. Like, there's yeah. there's a lot of, of nuance to how I identify feminism and, and what I think it means. What would you say to uh, a woman who wants to make her personal political, um, but feels like maybe she doesn't have the resources to do it or mm-hmm. the time to do it? Like, what are... What are ways that you found in your talking about all of these different intersections for people to have a big impact without necessarily, for example, a ton of financial resources? Well, it's free to talk to somebody. Like I think that's true. I think that, for now, unless Twitter gets its way with like asking people to Venmo you in order to give you a yeah, phone call. Seriously. Ugh. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. No, I think that like the I think that there's a ton of power in like women's social networks, and I don't mean that as like a commodified tech social network. I mean in terms of the people that you know um and i think that um in this day and in this day and age someone's like i'm so old in this day and age uh we meet in person a lot less and one thing that i think a super easy way to like foster an environment where women form a group and talk to each other about things is like start a book club i mean it sounds like it's it's, i'm in one yeah it's a book club's rock like they do reading is mega fun and it feels very safe to talk about these things through the prism of a book because at least at first you don't have to talk about yourself Mm -hmm. you don't have to talk about any part of your own experience that you may not be comfortable with and that's why like we often recommend that people have for example like group texts that are explicitly about talking about money Mm -hmm. and you can talk about like your salary you can talk about you know your what you pay for rent you know if you have Mm -hmm. debt all that kind of stuff because having a space that's explicitly dedicated to the topic means that you never have to do that awkward thing of bringing it up or Mm -hmm. introducing it or even testing whether or not someone else is okay with talking about it like you're Mm -hmm. already in the room and you're supposed to talk about this thing Mm -hmm. you know yeah totally I yeah I think that that that's a really a good thing to do and also I think like, I don't know, a, a safe space to talk about a, a prickly topic. I mean, I hate the phrase <laughs> safe space, but I do think that there are certain topics that you want to be feel safe talking totally. about. And I think money is one of the things that women, that it's awkward for us to talk about. I think another thing that like, I mean, this is kind of a tangent, but I think another thing that is very awkward for women to talk about is like health and diet and exercise because it's so personal and we get so much shit for all of our decisions around those things. And so anytime anybody has a different opinion, it feels like an attack. Oh yeah. Taking everything personally. Our office is entirely women and it's like an informal rule, but like one of the few rules we have is like, you're not allowed to make like negative food talk. Like you can't be like, Ooh, I shouldn't have this. Or like, I had such a big breakfast or like, Ooh, I didn't eat so I could have this. Like Mm -hmm. you're not allowed to do that because I mean, listen, you're allowed to do whatever you want. You can say whatever you want, but it's just But such... you're fired. But no. Oh my God, no. Oh my God, no, you would not. But but in all seriousness, though, I think it creates an environment where then other people com- feel compelled. Other women feel compelled to participate mm-hmm. in it. Or you feel compelled to, at the very least, validate it, you know? Mm-hmm. And what are you really validating with that? And I think, you know, ultimately there's so much of this stuff like money is i think a more complicated topic for a lot of people than food but food is pretty damn close and Mm -hmm. food and body and stuff like that it's one of those things where once one person is doing some weird talk around it Mm -hmm. it's like a virus you know that reminded me when we were talking like food and money both being awkward do you remember the episode of sex in the city uh Uh, yes you don't even need (laughs) you know exactly what i'm talking about right Uh, carrie needs money yep and and like the and charlotte won't help her and carrie gets offended i think one of the reasons that it's awkward to talk about is that i think a lot of times you assume you read into conversations about money as either requests for help or offers of help 
And like though that's that's awkward. If you feel like somebody is talking about their financial troubles with you, could we break down what happened in that episode for the listeners who probably have better things to do that like than us for watching that episode six times? So basically, long story short, Carrie Bradshaw has spent I think they totaled it forty thousand dollars on her designer shoes, and her she was originally going to move into she was going to buy her apartment with her boy her fiance, so they had already bought it. And they broke up. And so her like fiance was essentially like evicting her unless she bought back the apartment because he was going to sell it. And she didn't have any money and like literally had no money in savings, n- nothing except for her check as a columnist. And she went to Which her- was an insane. Which was- No <laughs> columnist makes that much money. <laughs> this is already fake news. Yeah, like, yeah, there's yeah. no this way this is, happened. This is crazy. But then she went to her friend, or no, she didn't actually ask her friend Charlotte York who, to be clear, did not work and was just recently divorced from an extremely wealthy man and lived in a Park Avenue, whatever, like got mad at her because that woman didn't automatically offer her the money to buy her her. apartment and then went over and like yelled at her. And to be clear, I think it was like one of the few like well done scenes in that show with the topic of money because Charlotte was like, "Um, excuse me, like it's not my responsibility to like be fiscally responsible on your behalf, whatever. and then she ends up just giving her the money anyway. She actually, Charlotte ends up giving her her like Tiffany engagement ring, which Charlotte, I which Carrie, I guess, pawns to buy the apartment. That's <laughs> so, good. It's like, okay, the amount, like I love that show, but the amount of cultural damage that that show has done to women's oh idea of money God. and spending and material consumption is just unreal. Yeah, but the original show is like, pretty good and it's like and it's it's funny because it's about like four women all of whom can be kind of assholes sometimes and having to like face the consequences interpersonally for their asshole behavior like and that's funny it's, yeah it's funny it's like but it's not like this is a blueprint for how to be this is how to be a woman it's like no this is a story of these four complicated flawed women who live in this world that is like not really some that has its problems but it's interesting that looking back at that show that they never bat an eyelash every other episode talking about like vibrators but yet the topic of money was almost never addressed and when it was it was like an unspeakable taboo right yeah that show is interesting about money but i do i do want horny money samantha to be like okay where she's not talking about dicks ever it's just about it's just what's it's what's just, happening in that she's 401k. just like horny about her stock portfolio she's like i'll tell you what's going up <laughs> the Dow. Um, we actually have some rapid fire money questions. Okay. Uh, we actually are bringing, we're bringing these to you guys uh, in partnership with Mint, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but it's an awesome app. Um, basically these questions, now I say rapid fire, but do not feel like you have to like spit out an answer. You can okay. take a moment. I don't have to Jim Jordan it and just say it really. Who's like, Jim Jordan? Jim Jordan is a member of Congress, a Republican who yells really loud and fast into a microphone during hearings. Don't do that. (laughs) Um, But uh, so, yeah, just whatever comes to mind. Number one, and we'll do television for this one. Okay. What is the big financial secret of your industry? The biggest financial secret of the industry is if you make a show, a hit show, if you create a hit show, it's like winning the lottery. It's like you, even if it's a show that like runs for like five seasons, even if it feels like nobody watches it, you are like God rich if you make a show. But the thing is, like, most shows... Actually, here's here's the secret. Most... That was already a good secret. No, here's another another secret. So Hollywood runs on announcements, right? Like, you're always seeing, like, ooh, this is being developed. So-and-so is... Developed doesn't mean dick. It just means somebody wrote you a check. The likelihood of it ever getting made, Mm. very, very low. It's like most most times you see announcements that are like, so-and-so is making this, and nothing ever comes of it. Like... You like I've sold a show that ended up dying. Most people who sell TV shows, it dies. Do you get a lot of money when you sell it? Uh, it depends on who you are, but yeah, you get like a teacher's salary if you're a new writer. You get like a teacher's salary worth for the original script, and then so like not far off from a book deal. Yeah, it's like it's like a book deal. But imagine if you would get a book deal and then you write it, and they're like, no, we're not going to publish it, and never gets made. Like that's the crazy thing about the industry is there are people here that live on selling things that never get made, selling scripts for movies that never get made, 
like rewriting scripts for movies that never get made, taking a pass at a show that never gets made, like shooting an entire pilot that nobody ever sees except except the executives who decide not to make it. Like so much happens below the surface here that never ever sees the light of day. And you can make a living never seeing the light of day. It is insane to me. It is like, it's crazy. Who has the time? I know. Who I mean, lots of people. I mean, lots of people. What do you invest in versus what are you cheap about? A couple of things. Um, I think that as I've gotten older and as I finally gotten to a point where it's like I'm financially comfortable, um, I'm very, I, I will invest in a really good pair of shoes. Like a pair of like, I have a pair of like combat boots that I bought that are like, I really, really wanted them and they were really expensive, but I'm going to wear the hell out of them. I They look good. I bought them and I was like, look, I, I love them. I can buy like three pairs of shoes that I only sort of like, or I can buy this one pair of shoes that I really like. Mm. So I, I'm kind of more choosy about like pieces of fashion that I will wear or carry all the time. Um, I also have gotten really uh, commensurately, because I feel guilty about spending money on myself, um, I have a rule where if I spend a dollar on clothes for myself, I have to give a dollar to charity. I, I don't do it like one to one, but if I like go shopping for clothes and it's like I spent $200 on clothes or whatever, then the next time I spend money on something, I like it to be something charitable. Like today it was, um, I gave to the food pantry in my hometown because uh, they're changing the SNAP benefit requirements so that now you have to produce, yeah. So like a lot of people are gonna be cut off from like food stamps. So I did that because it was like, well, I feel, I'm mad. I also just bought myself something, so I'm gonna give money to other people who probably need it way more than I need Kenzo boots. Um, um, but yeah, the thing that I actually, <laughs> thing that I'm kind of, I kind of scrimp on, um, my fiance would get mad at me for saying this, but like wine, I love a good glass of wine, but like in terms of like what, if I'm just going to have like a glass of wine and watch a movie, I don't I'll buy like $3 Trader Joe's wine. Like I don't. Oh no, girl. The yeah. sulfite. <laughs> the sulfites. I know. I just, I just, it just doesn't. Does it give you a headache? Cheap wine gives me a really bad headache. Oh, well, aren't you fancy? I know. It's a <laughs> headache from being so gauche. It's because I'm so, it's a headache from being around poor people things. <laughs> no, but there's often like, it's often got a lot of sulfites and sugar and shit. I don't huh. know. Interesting. It could be psychosomatic, but I feel like, and also to be fair, I will stand by this. You can get really, really good bottles of wine for like eleven dollars. So yeah, it's yeah. Not like you don't have to get oh, like a fifty dollar yeah. no, bottle not, of wine. I'm not. I'm not spending. That's what. That's what I mean. It's like I okay, will go up. But that's not two buck chuck. Up, I'll I'll drink two buck chuck. But if I want to like step it up, I'll drink like twelve dollar whatever the real chuck is. What has been your best investment and why? Best investment. This is going to sound like a little bit sentimental, oh. um, but. 13 years ago, I adopted a cat. She's still still around, still Kitty. kicking. What's her name? Eleanor. But she oh. thinks her name is Pretty because I call her Pretty. What has been your biggest money mistake and why? My biggest money mistake was not staying on top of student loan payments when I was young. That is you go like- into default? What? You went into default? I went into default and I had to go through a loan rehab program. Same. Yeah. Not for loan, credit card, but yes. Yeah, so where, where you pay, make payments on time for a certain amount of time mm -hmm. and then um, eventually the, the delinquencies get expunged from your report, but it took so long. I had to be so diligent about it. And actually when I started making money from TV and the podcast, and I just was like, I don't even care how financially responsible this is. I'm going to attack my student loans. Like they, like I'm going to beat them to death. And mm. so over a year and a half, I paid off like tens of thousands of dollars in student loans, just cause I was like, I want this out of my life. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, making not staying on top of it was a huge mistake. And I wish that I could go back and yell at myself and be like, pay your goddamn student loans. Yeah. What was your credit score at its worst? Do you remember? I think it was like 580 or something Oof, like that. Yeah. It was, I think mine might have been in the high fours. What's it now? Uh, it's a little over 700. Good for you. Yeah. Like, what is your biggest current money insecurity? My biggest current money insecurity. Um, so I'm getting married, and uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm getting. I, I'm not insecure about getting married. <laughs> um, but we were. I was like not a wedding person, and then now that I'm with the person that I'm with, I'm like, oh no, actually, I do want to have all of our friends and family in one place. That would be really cool. And as we've been planning it, it's like this is going to cost quite a bit of money. Mm. And <laughs> Josh, my fiance, is like doing the the boy thing where like women kind of have this we have this part of our brain where we like 
kind of know how much weddings cost because we just absorb it by like osmosis. We have a sense. and a lot of episodes of Say Yes to the Dress. Mm-hmm. A lot of ep- exactly, and then we hear, have we watch our friends slowly go insane as they're planning their own right. weddings and the sticker shock and all that stuff. And so we kind of know. We kind of have like a rough idea of what to expect. Men, no. Like <laughs> Josh would be like, he'll be like, well, why don't we have like a Korean barbecue chef and also we hire this other chef to come? And it's like, do you know how much that's going to yeah. come? Three catering companies? That's crazy. So um, it's it's going to be, I think, we do have a wedding planner to be like an intermediary to be like, no, this is how much things cost. Um, so it won't be just like me telling him things and him being like, that can't be right. And then like that having that, having that be a fight. But yeah, the wedding stuff is going to be expensive. And also we are trying to save money to buy a house. Mm-hmm. And not like right away, but within the next couple of years. And, you know, New York is, is insanely expensive. LA is up there. It's it's expensive to try to buy something, and we would want to buy something that have a, that would have a yard. And so, the idea of like how much are these like big? We have these two big coming expenses, and that's probably the thing that causes me the most stress. But the good thing is, this is the first time in my life when I've actually thought that buying a house was something that was within reach. So it's a good problem. Yeah, you know? no, it's, totally. I think I'm never gonna buy a home in in Manhattan. I don't think it'll ever be worth it to me because the price that you pay for what you get. I'm never going to buy a home that doesn't have two bathrooms. Is that so much to ask yeah, in New that York is, City? I think that's not too much to ask. I think that's a normal person thing to want for sure. Yeah. But also, I mean, this is something we won't get into it now, but uh, a lot of people think that one has to buy a home and you really don't. There are many other ways to be smart with your money. If you, it's important to you, you should, but yeah, shouldn't you shouldn't feel you, obligated. You don't have to. I know a couple of people that are um, pretty high up in TV writing who are just like, nah, we just like renting. Yeah. We, they just like... A lot of perks to it. Yeah. And there's a lot of other things you can do with your money. What is the financial habit that has helped you the most? Hmm. The financial habit that has helped me the most. Probably leaving crumpled up change in my pockets. And so then when I wear How do you crumple up change? Well, like, you know, they, they oh, put bills. The, the bills and then they put the change on top oh. of it and you crumple it up. Because <laughs> then the next time I wear those pants, it's a surprise... It's surprise money. It's not really your best financial <laughs> habit. No, I was like, this is a bad habit. <laughs> because then whenever I take the pants off, money falls out. And I need, I'm like, you need to be more responsible. <laughs> Picturing no. you in some kind of like sexy moment. <laughs> ching, ching. <laughs> no, I think, I think um, my best financial habit is that um, I have a savings account that I just like once my money is like in savings, I just like do not touch it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm very good about like respecting the wall. Like what I have in my checking account is how much money I have. Like Mm -hmm. I treat that as though that's the only money that I have. And there's I have a couple savings accounts where I just do not touch it in any way. What are they for? Um, Well, one of them I have a business. So like once you once you work in this town, honey, uh, it, it makes a lot of sense for tax purposes to yeah. get like an S corp or a C sure. corp. And my corp. It's not just an LA thing. Yeah. You guys need to chill out in this. <laughs> it's not unique to LA. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have a I have like one account where like when I get paid for things that I I'm doing like under the corporation, that it goes there, and then another one that's like personal, and then I have like a 401k and a an IRA and that sort nice. of thing. Last question. When did you first feel, quote, successful? And what does that word mean to you? Oh, man. Um, Let's hear it. I, I think I had this green couch that I bought from Anthropology, And I bought it like four years ago. And it was like, it was like the most expensive How thing. How much was it? It's like $2,300. It's an expensive couch. An expensive but not couch. nearly as expensive as they go, man. Those no, they can, get, can go up to they 10 can get grand. Up there, yeah. It was like a $2,300 couch that I picked out the color and I got it customized. And it was, I got it like right after I signed my contract, a contributor contract with CNN, which wasn't even that big of a contract. But I was like, I I have the money to spend on something that I like that is nice. And I'd never had a nice couch before. And when it came and they like unwrapped it and put it down and I sat on it, I was like, I did it. <laughs> Aww. I still, I still That's have it. That's a good one. I still have it. It's like, I mean, it's like made incredibly well. Like I moved mm. it across the country and it's, it's really like well made and it's still beautiful. Um, but that was the first time that I was like, I did it. <laughs> I did it. You got the cow. Yeah. How nice. Well, thank you so much for joining us yeah, today. Yeah, this was fun. Yeah. Uh, where can people find more of what you do? Well, you can watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, which it's on all the time. 
uh, I don't know if people know this, but at any given point in the day, it's always, it's on. always, it is literally always on. Um, you can also listen to Hysteria, which mm. you can find on Spotify and Apple and all the places where they have podcasts. And you can follow me on social media if you want. It's a lot of politics, but if you're into that, then I'm into it. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Erin. Yeah, thank you. So as I mentioned in our rapid fire questions, another amazing product that Intuit makes and which I personally love is Mint. Mint is a budgeting tool that basically tells you everything you need to know about your own personal finances. It breaks down all your different spending categories, shows you when you're going over budget, helps track your bills, when you need to move money, what you owe, when you're getting paid, and do everything it takes to basically get total control over your personal finances. Mint is actually the first app that I ever downloaded to get better with money, and that's over five years ago now, and I still use it basically every day to track my own spending habits and make sure that I'm learning from my mistakes. They even go so far as to put like a literal pie chart of your spending up so you can see exactly what you're doing at any given time. If you've been looking to get a handle on your budget and start spending a lot smarter, I highly recommend you check out Mint at the link in our description or our show notes. Mm -hmm.